Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, an animal sanctuary hosts a fundraiser, local microbrewery offers craft beers in cans, and a church holds a craft show to raise funds for a mission trip. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Oakland County Parks are set to receive improvements and many of the changes are coming to Addison Oaks. Addison Oaks will get a new playground, an improved waterfront area, a new trail map, and sign updates thanks to Oakland County Parks Executive Officer Dan Stencil for presenting the proposal to the Oakland County Board of Commissioners Finance Committee. A limited number of high-performance race cars are assembled just east of M24. Copo Camaro is a place where people from across the country are accepted for their custom dream car. These factory-built cars are meticulously engineered and crafted to dominate at drag strips with raw power. The most recent recipients of a Copo Custom traveled from California to pick up their nearly $200,000 ride. By the way, COPO stands for Central Office Production Order, and that they do. And in the coming days, members from Lake Point Community Church of Oxford will set off on a mission to Belize, South America. The goal is to bring help and hope to those they encounter. A raise funds for trips like this, Lake Point uh, Church is hosting a craft show on November 10th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The craft show will host over 60 booths, including a bake sale, raffle, and lunch. Food includes soup, grilled cheese, sandwiches, and chili. Yum. Adults are $3 at the door, and kids under the age of 12, they're free. Homegrown Brewing Company in downtown Oxford is offering beer to go. On October 2nd, Homegrown began making some of its beers available for take-home in 16-ounce cans. Seven types of beers can be purchased in four packs. Please remember to take home responsibly. All you ghosts and goblins out there who are preparing for their yearly tricking, village and township begging begins at 6 and run, run, runs till 7.30. And drivers, please take care while driving the streets during that time. And parents, on November 1st, Dr. Corey of Oxford Smile Center will be doing a buyback program. Your treaters will get a dollar per pound of candy that they turn in to Dr. Corey, who has then who will then give it to the American Legion Post 108 to send to our troops overseas. That's really a cool program. I'm really it glad is. that they're doing that. I didn't know about it until this year and, mm -hmm. and Tracy who is Dr. Corey's assistant, called us to see if we could get the word out um, to get that candy off the streets. So I think it's a yeah. great program. I think the doctor does this every year, too. So, he does, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. That's so. what she told me. And speaking of, of uh, Dr. Corey calling us to get the word out, I want to talk a little bit about the Senate Bill 637, which is actually running its way through the House. Um, you out there, it affects you. Whether we end up losing our franchise fees because of this bill or not, the people in the community will lose their local control over their rights away. The Senate is looking to give that control to big cable providers, AT&T, Charter, Comcast, Spectrum. They're giving our rights away to those big companies, not to mention those big companies will not be collecting franchise fees anymore, which is what keeps us going. So not only will you lose your television station in your community, if you have one, if you don't have one in your community, your community gets those franchise fees. So um, say the village of Oxford gets about $25,000 a year in franchise mm -hmm. fees, and that's half. They give us half, they keep half. 
what twenty-five thousand dollars they say they're going to use on sidewalks downtown. So they're, the, each community is going to end up depending on the state. Addison Township uses those funds for chlorine. Mm -hmm. um, they keep half as well. So it's the communities are going to end up depending on the state for those funds for anything that they. Lapeer uses those funds for a police officer and a firefighter. We're going to lose people in our community. We're going to lose employees. We're going to lose your television station in this community. So. It's going to be a loss of money also to the township because yeah. the township's going to lose the rights. The peg fees. For the peg fee right. rights. Right. They um, get paid for those rights away as well. Yeah, I think this has been probably the greatest Huge. assault, yeah. I, said, I think, on these small stations mm -hmm. yeah. since actually the development. I think this station has right. been around for, what, over 20 years? Oh, yeah, 20, so. 25. We've been right. Here. So. Um, the, the, the big cable providers are spending billions of dollars every year in lobbyists going to Washington, talking to your senators, Debbie Stabenow, Gary Peters, uh, Mike Bishop. They're talking to those people every single day and convincing them that this is a good bill. Um, NATOA, as well as Alliance for Community Media, who um, NATOA hires Protect, which um, the attorney for Protec is Mike Watsa. We're also fortunate that he's our attorney. He's been going as a single um, representative to Lansing and saying, we don't like this bill. None of the communities like this bill. We need every community to get the word to Lansing that they do not support this bill. And unfortunately, and I hate to be the ugly person in this group, but right now we represent Oxford Addison um, the village of Oxford Leonard. and Leonard and not any of those four communities have written to Lansing that they don't support this bill. They've also received um, emails saying they can put their name on this list that Mike Watsa has. Their name's not on that list. So I don't know if you don't understand what this bill is all about. I don't under know if you don't understand what, um, that, how that's going to impact your community, but please just call your community leaders and tell them you don't want it. It's uh, it's an urgent issue. It is. By all means. Whether you they, sorry, whether they keep you, know, you keep a television station or not, you're going to lose hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars. What's interesting too is I did talk to a peg station up in uh, Bay City, and yeah. they weren't yeah. aware, you know, yeah. that this was that yeah. critical and that yeah that type of a concern. Uh, it is, and and uh, most of the stations that are like us, peg stations, are mm -hmm. aware of it, due to. Mm -hmm. Uh, our representative and attorney, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Mr. Watsa. Yeah. So he's doing a great job out there, but we need to spread the word. And you folks, you know, mm -hmm. we the people, it would be you the people, decide if we stay on the air or not. Last June, I went to Washington, D.C. to try to talk to our senators, along with the Alliance for Community Media Group. There were 22 of us that went. I'm fighting for this community to keep their funds. If you don't want to keep OCTV, I get that. But this community is my home too. I no longer live in this community, but this is my home. And so I'm fighting. Let's all fight together. Really, one voice is not very loud. All of us speaking against losing our rights of our own property that our taxpayers are paying for to big cable providers is not right. Just think of the things that you will give up. For example, sports programs yeah. and the downtown uh, mm -hmm. representation that we give mm -hmm. on uh, grand openings, that kind of mm. thing, and along with businesses. Everything we cover. Uh, and also the, the um, political uh, business meetings that we also uh, record every week. So we you people, folks know what's going on. People ask us every time there's a, a, a community meeting, I, I'd say once or twice a week, we have people in your community asking us for copies of those. And that just won't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. so and we record say. and we produce um, information for you folks that you can't find on any of the other major stations TV, right. like channel four channel seven mm -hmm. they don't they don't go forward and they don't right. dig out that news and we do so if you folks uh, yeah. like us being around we like us being around yeah, for you too sure. so yeah. uh, please talk with your representatives uh, send them letters emails whatever you need to do and tell them that you do not support bill SD 630 SB 637 mm -hmm. That's Senate bill 637 there's also one 5g that also impacts peg fees. Um, we're worried about us because we love doing what we do, delivering everything that we deliver for this community, for non, 
nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. I'm asking, um, if we've done something for you that has changed your life or helped your life, please give us a call because we are sending video testimonies to our state senators. I had Debbie Stabenow tell me this didn't concern her. And I want her to see that the people of Oxford that she represents really cares. So give us a call, 248-628-9658. And don't forget, September 6th is election day. Get out and vote. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so there's our soapbox. That's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories or others, you can catch us on our website at OCCTV.org and on YouTube and of course your regular cable channel Spectrum Channel 191 and AT&T Channel 99. Coming up on OCTV this week is our very own Cody Wright with sports. Schooling around with on um, Alexis Weir. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's our new girl, Alexis Weir. How can I forget so her? Can, she's very good. She's so cute, too. <laughs> and you won't want to miss also Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. Why well, kind of fumble through that one? <laughs> I'm Terry Stiles. Thanks for watching Oxford News this week, where we bring your local news to you. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. I was. Welcome to Science and the News, I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, on October 11th, a Russian Soyuz craft carrying two astronauts to the International Space Station had an issue with one of its boosters causing a crash landing about 400 kilometers away from the launch site in Kazakhstan. The astronauts came away alive and intact, but the failed flight may complicate things on the ISS, perhaps permanently. U.S. astronaut Nick Haig and Russian cosmonaut Alexei Ochinin are in good conditions, but after an extremely bumpy ride, including g-forces of six to seven times the gravity on Earth's surface, it could have gone another way. The average person might pass out under forces of about 5G. All crewed Soyuz launches are suspended until NASA and the Russian space agency Roscosmos Cosmos figure out exactly what happened and how to prevent it in the future, meaning no one can now reach the space station, and we'll cover that next week. In our next story, a huge underground fungus that is one of the largest living organisms on the planet has turned out to be both bigger and older than thought. It may have been quietly spreading this through the soil of Michigan since the end of the last ice age. James B. Anderson of the University of Toronto in Canada and his colleagues discovered the enormous R. malaria gallica fungus in the late 1980s while studying fungi that were killing red pines on a Michigan plantation. We found one genetic individual occupying this site, says Anderson. It spanned about 0.37 square kilometers. At the time, they estimated it was at least 1,500 years old and weighed at least 100,000 kilograms. They published their findings in 1992. At the time, the fungus was the serious contender for the largest living organism, but bigger fungi have since been found. An individual of A. Ostoye in the Malheur National Forest in Oregon spans 9.6 square kilometers. Confusingly, the Michigan and the Oregon fungi are both informally called the humongous fungus. Anderson and his colleagues have now revisited the fungus, which had been left to its own devices since early 1990s. They collected 245 samples, far more than before, allowing them to get a better sense of its borders. It turns out the fungus weighs at least 400,000 kilograms, four times larger than the initial estimate. The fungus grew from a single individual, so its greater size implies it is also older than thought. We're now saying 2,500 years based on our estimates of growth rate, and that's a lower bound, says Anderson. If the fungus spent some time in stasis rather than growing, it could be much older. The upper limit is the end of the last ice age about 11,000 years ago because there were no trees in Michigan when it was covered in ice. It may go all the way back to post-glaciation when the forest was re-establishing on that site, says Anderson. The team was also able to estimate how many mutations the fungus has accumulated over its life because the parts closer to the edge are younger and carry more mutations than the old parts in the center. Wow. In our last story, weird rock falls can explode more intensely than the most potent conventional bombs are more common than we thought. 
Such extreme events produce a shockwave that can snap trees growing hundreds of meters away. They're extremely weird phenomena which have been somehow overlooked, says Fabio de Blasio at the University of Milano Bicocca in, in Italy. The first recorded example took place in Yosemite National Park, California on July 10th of 1996. Two large masses of rock fell from Glacier Point and plummeted 665 meters. On hitting the ground, they released a blast of air that snapped or toppled a thousand trees up to about a half a kilometer away. That was the subject of a study published in 2000, although such events remained a curiosity. Now, de Blasio and his colleagues have identified 21 other extremely energetic rock falls from the past two decades, mostly in the European Alps and the Dolomites in Italy. They argue that this makes these events less rare than once thought. To cause such a shock wave on the order of 10,000 cubic meters of rock has to fall several hundred meters. The impact is so violent that the rocks are smashed into powder. Typically, they develop in areas where erosion has been quite fast, says de Blasio. Based on calculations, de Blasio and his colleagues estimate that just one of these extreme rock falls can release more than 80 billion joules of energy, more than any non-nuclear bomb. Wow. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenney. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Hello and welcome back to School News. I hope everyone had an amazing homecoming week. I know homecoming is over, but the excitement isn't. Athletic Director Jordan Ackerman spoke with OCTV to introduce the new high school assistant principal, Christy Gibson Marshall. Here's Ackerman. All right, I'm Jordan Ackerman here live with OCTV, and today we're going to uh, introduce our new assistant principal, Christy Gibson Marshall. Hi there. Uh, Christy, why don't you go ahead and just tell us how the year's going so far? Oh, this year's amazing. I'm having a great time. There are um, so many events and so much fun happening in our school. We're doing some really cool, fun things. Spirit Week is the best, by the way. So I've noticed you've put this uh, newsletter out to the parents, which has uh, just taken off, and I know the parents love it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So the goal of the parent newsletter is to get information to parents in a way that's easy and has lots of links so that they can get the information that they need in a timely fashion. So our goal is truly to get that communication out to parents. So you've made the transition over from a elementary principal to a high school assistant principal. How has that uh, transition been going? So there's a, I really love the fact that there's a team here. So when we need to talk issues out, we go to our team, we talk it through and make it happen. As an elementary principal, you are kind of everything all by yourself. So it's really nice to have a team. That's what I really love about being at OHS. I'm Jordan Ackerman. We'll take it back to you in the station. Our first student host will be doing school news with me next Monday, so don't miss it. From now on, we'll have a new student host every other week picked by you, and here's how you can do it. You can submit yourself or someone you know with the reason why you believe they should be picked to our Facebook page or our Twitter page. Remember, you do have to be following the account to be considered, and of course, watch the news every week to see the new winner. This isn't just for students, parents and teachers can get involved as well. All you need is one of these two social media accounts or send us an email to manager at OCCTV.org. Your submissions can be from students at the high school, middle school, or even the elementary school. Before we go for today, I would like to say a big thank you to Oakland Schools for its funding in our new work-study lab for significantly impaired students. The school district wouldn't have been able to afford the new addition without your help. Look forward to the new class coming to the high school. And that's all for School News. Here's Cody Wright with School Sports.
What's going on, Wildcat fans? Cody Wright back here once again with this week's Sports Report. This week we have some great news to go over with the equestrian team as well as a follow-up on the last few games of boys football, boys soccer, and girls volleyball. This has been a phenomenal fall sports season here at Oxford High School and it shows that we have some great seasons to come. Anyhow, let's dive in and see how this last week shaped up. Uh, for the 19th year in a row, the Oxford equestrian team has qualified for the state championship. Both Oxford and Clarkson recently moved on to the regional E championship and Oxford went on to win the Division A Reserve Regionals with 407 points. We defeated Clarkson, we defeated Cedar Springs and St. John's just to name a few. Uh, the team ha now heads to Midland for the state championship. Uh, we certainly do have a very strong outfit. We have for a while, and hopefully next week we will have some exciting news to report on. So best of luck to all the coaches and to all the riders. Anyhow, let's change gears and switch over to the Boys Football Club, who have been absolutely outstanding this year as well. Uh, last weekend, all three clubs took on Clarkston, one of the top schools we faced this season. Uh, varsity was on the road and really buckled down and played to their potential coming out with the win 20 to 17. Both JV and the freshman team both played here at home and delivered with much potential and momentum grabbing the win 42 to 6 and 28 to nothing. We certainly have had a great varsity club with guys like Trent Meyer, Joseph Vaccaro and Drew Carpenter. However, when these younger guys step up, it really reassures you that these big shoes will be ready to be filled when the time comes. Boys soccer also played this last week, both varsity and JV on two separate occasions. On the fourth, the boys went on the road and took on Kettering, varsity taking the win two to one, and JV also coming through on top one to nothing. On the ninth, the boys returned home and took on Fenton. It was a tight match for both clubs and the inches didn't fall on our side a few times. And that's really all it takes. Varsity came out with a two to two tie. However, JV fell short one to nothing. And last but not least, the JV Girls Volleyball Club traveled to Clarkson to battle it out on the ninth as well. Varsity didn't play, but JV managed to capture one match but fell overall on the game two to one. Uh, for the most part though, this week was successful. We did struggle in some areas, but the season isn't over yet. We still have to finish up uh, the regular season for football and then head into playoffs. A lot of these sports are either finishing up the regular season or gearing up for the grind that playoff sports offers. For more info on these events and more, go to OxfordAthletics.org. Plenty of game breakdowns, statistics, and more all right there for you to find at OxfordAthletics.org. While you're at it, might as well check us out at OCCTV.org. All of our coverage of these sporting events, along with many other programs we put together for the community, can be found on our YouTube page, which you can access through the website. Once again, folks, that is OCCTV.org. And that's going to do it for this week's report. I want to thank you all for watching and remind you to tune in next time. But until then, I'm Cody Wright. Go Wildcats. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, U.S. auto safety regulators are moving to allow a new generation of brighter self-dimming headlights that won't blind other drivers on the road ahead. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is proposing to permit so-called adaptive driving beam headlights on new cars according to an agency notice made public on October 11th. The advanced lights essentially operate as high beam headlights at all times while automatically dimming specific portions of the beam to cast less light on oncoming vehicles detected by sensors. The technology has the potential to reduce the risk of crashes by increasing visibility without increasing glare, NHTSA said in a notice made public on October 11th. The agency added that it offers potentially significant safety benefits in avoiding collisions with pedestrians, cyclists, animals and roadside objects. Automakers, including Toyota Motor Corporation and Audi AG, for years have urged NHTSA to update the headlight standard to accommodate the high-tech lights, saying they can improve safety by providing better illumination while avoiding glare for other drivers. The technology is available in other markets, including Europe, but car makers have interpreted NHTSA's long-standing headlight rule as prohibiting the technology. 
The agency is seeking comments on the proposal which would establish performance requirements for adaptive driving beams. Toyota petitioned the uh, agency to amend its headlight rules in 2016. In our next story, fully driving, that is to say fully self-driving cars may be on the fast lane to U.S. roads under a pilot program the Trump administration said on October 9th it was considering which would allow real world road testing for a limited number of the vehicles. Self-driving cars used in the program would, would potentially need to have technology disabling the vehicle if a sensor fails or barring vehicles from traveling above a safe speed, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said in a document made public on October 9th. NHTSA said it was considering whether it would have to be notified of any accident within 24 hours and was seeking public input on what other data should be disclosed, including near misses. The U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation in 2017 to speed the adoption of self-driving cars, but the Senate has not approved it. Several safety groups oppose the bill, which is backed by car makers. It has only a slender chance of being approved in 2018, congressional aides said. NHTSA said the pilot project would seek to find how best to foster the safe introduction of vehicles with high and full driving automation onto our nation's highways. Real world data would help create methods of validating the safety performance of self-driving vehicles and writing safety rules for it, it added. The Trump administration said it was working to revise safety rules that bar fully self bar full, fully self-driving cars from the roads without equipment such as steering wheels, pedals, and mirrors. Automakers must currently meet nearly 75 auto safety standards, many of them written with the assumption that a licensed driver would be able to control the vehicle using traditional human controls. Under the law, automakers can petition for an exemption up for up to 2,500 vehicles for vehicle safety standards as long as they are at least as safe as existing vehicles. General Motors in January filed a petition seeking an exemption to use fully automated vehicles as part of a ride-sharing fleet it plans to deploy in 2019. NHTSA has not declared the GM petition complete a step necessary before it rules on the merits. Alphabet Inc.'s Waymo unit plans to launch an autonomous ride-hailing service in Arizona this year with no human driver behind the steering wheel. Unlike GM, Waymo's vehicles will initially have human controls. NHTSA said it would partner with state and local governments in developing a pilot program. NHTSA could require companies to design vehicles so they know their location and the local rules of the road, while states and cities would enforce the rules. And in the recall front, Toyota will recall a total of 2.4 million gasoline electric hybrids at home and abroad over a hybrid system issue that can lead to stalling. The recall, which includes the Prius and Aurus, covers vehicles produced between October 2008 and November of 2014, the automaker said. The recall affects about 1.3 million vehicles sold in Japan, 830,000 in North America, and 290,000 vehicles sold in Europe. Vehicles sold in China and Africa and Oceania and other regions are also affected. Toyota said in rare situations, some vehicles could fail to switch to a fail-safe driving mode in the event of a fault with the hybrid system, which can lead to a loss of power and result in stalling. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways.